Hi, welcome again to the Horsepower Shop. Fuel injection has been around for quite a while now, and from the earliest mechanical units to the latest computer controlled systems, well, it's always been a more efficient, more powerful way to feed fuel to your engine. That's right. Now, Chevy first introduced fuel injection back in 1957 with their 283. And this 327 powered VET was the last to use the mechanical style in 65. Now, fuel injection has sure come a long way since then, and today you can't even buy a new vehicle with a carb on it. Of course, Chuck still got one on the 283 and his 65 wagon here. Now, you might remember a short time ago we added this Holly carb, Edelbrock intake, and MSD ignition, after which we made about 180 rear wheel horsepower on the dyno jet. But that's still old tech on an old car. So today we're going to upgrade the fuel system with multi-point electronic fuel injection. This kit from Edelbrock contains almost everything that you need to complete the conversion. Now the intake mounts a 750 CFM throttle body and fuel injectors right down here in the runners. It also includes a fuel pump and filter, an ignition upgrade, fuel lines and a wiring harness that connects everything to the ECU. Now, final fuel and spark calibration are dialed in with this handheld programmer. Well, I've already disconnected the battery before draining the radiator and removing the carburetor. Guess now we can pull this distributor. Then remove the alternator bracket and the upper radiator hose. The temp sending unit is the next to go. Finally, the intake itself. Well, now we're ready to drop in the new intake. Now, I've gone ahead and cleaned the mating surfaces, dropped in our new Mr. Gasket Ultra Seals, and laid in a bead of silicone on each end. Now, Joe, if you'll give me a hand with this. You bet. We want to drop it straight down and not disturb those gaskets. Good job. There we go. Snug the intake bolts down, starting from the center, working in a clockwise direction. Then torque them down to 25 foot-pounds. Then reconnect any vacuum lines, the transmission kick down linkage, and the throttle linkage. Be sure to check it for smooth operation all the way from idle through wide open. Well, now we can test fit this harness by connecting it to the injectors and as many sensors as possible. There you go. This way we'll find a suitable place to drill a hole in the firewall to pass the harness through. Oh, by the way, we want a spot that's away from intense heat and one that offers access from inside the car. Okay, Chuck, start sending it through. There we go. Now, this one is for the power relay. It supplies 12 volts to our computer. Next, this big one here is for the ECU itself. Finally, this one is for that handheld programmer you saw earlier. Oh, by the way, we took the inside of the glove box out and modified it so we can fit the ECU right inside. Pretty slick, huh? That way it doesn't take up much room. It stays dry and well protected. The distributor needs to be modified with this new pickup and shutter wheel that will give the computer both engine speed and firing location. Now, nothing wrong with MSD, but they use electronics that just aren't compatible with this modification, so we're going to be using a stock Delco distributor. Now, the first thing that we want to do is go ahead and drive out this roll pin so we can remove the drive gear and the shims. Then remove the distributor shaft. the vacuum advance, and the ignition module. Then we can go ahead and install the new pickup in the distributor housing. Well, next we can go ahead and install the shutter wheel on the rotor mounting plate. And since the computer is going to control timing advance, we'll install this little timing lock plate right here. That's it and we'll hold it in place with the original advanced springs. After sliding the shaft back into the housing, 
Give it a spin to make sure the shutter teeth don't interfere with the pickup. Now once that checks out, we're ready for the shims and the drive gear. Now what you want down here on this end is 15 to 30 thousandths clearance and well if that checks out, you can go ahead and reinstall the rotor. With the engine at 10 degrees before top dead center, we can go ahead and drop in the distributor. Now, you want to make sure that the rotor points to the number one plug position, which we've marked here on the distributor body. Once the distributor's down, we can go ahead and hook it up to the ignition amplifier that we've mounted here on the firewall. While Chuck completes the ignition, here's something else to spark your interest. A word from our sponsors. We'll be back with our EFI conversion after this. Hi, right, welcome back to the shop and our fuel injection swap. Well, so far we've installed an Edelbrock intake and throttle body, we've laid in our wiring harness, mounted the computer inside the car, and modified this distributor. Well, now we need to upgrade the Chevelle's fuel delivery system after we get it up in the air. All fuel injection systems need a return line for fuel that bypasses the injectors. So the first thing we're going to do is add one to our pickup and sender assembly. Now you may have to drop your tank to do this, but check this out. Looks like we got lucky. Ours is going to come out with the tank still in place. All right. There you go. Thanks. You know, needless to say, when you work around gas fumes, you want to be extra careful. That means an empty tank, good ventilation, and of course, no smoking. Now, with this fuel sending unit out, we now want to drill a 5 16 hole in it for that new return line. Next, we bend this return line so it directs return fuel away from the pickup. We also made this little support brace to attach the two of them. Now I'm going to take all of this to a local radiator shop and have it all soldered together. Meanwhile, I've been plumbing the fuel pump and the filter. Now, since electric pumps push a whole lot better than they pull, this is a good location. It'll keep it low and close to the gas tank. Now, you'll notice it's also directional, so you want to make sure that the arrow points in the direction of flow. Clean fuel is a must for fuel injection. Since the smallest particle can easily clog an injector and cause poor performance. Now, our kit came with this inline fuel filter that we're going to mount right here between the pump and the engine. Well, here's our modified sending unit with the return line we've added, and it's ready to go back in the tank. We're using our old feed line here as part of our return line that we've connected with this rubber hose to the one we just added. Now, Edelbrock includes this high pressure hose that we'll use as our new supply line. Our next job under here is to put power to the pump. Now, this harness connects to the terminals on the pump. This other end goes to the main harness up in the engine compartment. Finally, add the O2 sensor to the passenger side head pipe. Make sure you mount it so the harness connector will reach. Well, after rechecking our connections, topping off the coolant, and reconnecting the battery, well, I guess we're ready to fire this thing up. Go ahead and crank it, Chuck. Well, now we can dial in our fuel injection using this handheld controller. It'll help compensate for various engine combinations, and, well, once we get everything set, we'll strap it to the dyno jet and see what kind of power we're making. Well, what's the story? 220 horsepower. That's quite a jump from that 180 baseline. Yeah, and the drivability mileage is probably going to pick up too. Now, it cost us about $1,900 for this setup and took us a weekend in the driveway. Money well spent, I'd say. You bet. Well, that's it for our EFI project, but there's more horsepower ahead. Stay tuned. Next, Mopar Mania invades Gateway International Raceway in America's heartland. And Chuck gets to the heart of high performance brakes in this week's Quick Tech.
This week it's an annual event at Gateway International Raceway in St. Louis where you won't find any Chevys, no Fords, but uh, anybody like Mopars? Yeah! You get the drift. It's billed as a monster Mopar weekend. An event that's grown from humble beginnings to a bash that truly lives up to its name. The first year we did it, we had 80 cars, and we thought we were uh, just knocking them dead. And here 16 years later? 16 years later, it's 800 to 1,000 cars. Some of those cars came to race in classes ranging from the Max Wedge Shootout to the Indy Quick 16. Exhibition racers included Chris DeSalvo and his NHRA Pro Stock truck, and even this Ram Club jet truck kerosene burning door slammer piloted by Paul Hot Rod Stender. That pass we just uh, did was about 40 gallons worth. 40 gallons in one pass? Yeah, 40 gallons. I think it's about it 160 gallons for a mile I think we get with this thing. <laughs> Everybody recognizes the General Lee from the Dukes of Hazards, but here in the show car area, well, it's the Mopars with the high impact colors and the low production numbers that grab your attention. Case in point, this 1970 Chrysler 300H was produced for only one year. Loaded with a 440 Magnum, it's a rare breed that went for a pricey $6,900. The aftermarket airbag is optional. Then how about this plum crazy 71 Cuda convertible, one of only 17 ever made. Or this 70 Sublime TA Challenger, rushed into limited production to compete in the Trans Am Racing Series. Lots of rally red AAR Cudas were made in 1970, but only a handful with red interior. Well, you get the idea. The rare originals here run the gamut. But don't forget about the Superbirds that dominated the circle tracks back in 1970. And of course, you gotta love the modified Mopars, like Ken Helton's 69 Roadrunner with a blown 440. Anybody can restore one. It takes a real man to cut one up. So I like this, this is what I like. Well, we've always been a little tick left of center. And uh, we're very loyal. We, we, we like our products a lot. I, we tend to think we're more loyal to our products than the Ford and the Chevy guys are. Mopar Mavens love to race their machines, too. And the weekend drag racing competition attracted people like Kenny Lazari driving a Dodge with a 605-inch Hemi that he built at work. It's a 605-inch Hemi. It's a legend Hemi and it's all Indy cylinder head. We, we, we made the whole engine. Now, the fastest door car has to be the 69 AMX driven by Randy Brewer. It's got a top alcohol Hemi block with twin 1050 carbs and two stages of nitrous. Randy's raring to take it into the high sixes during eliminations. We have the horsepower, we, we could use it, but you know we, we, we're doing all we can do to try to figure out how to use it. Well, on the next run, Randy goes for broke, uh, literally. Hear that sound? That's a nitrous pop that put him and the car out of competition. No doubt the Mopar stars of the show were two legends of Superstock. NHRA record holder and engine builder Bob Reed up against his buddy and Mopar race king Ronnie Sox, who started his career back in the early 60s. A guy came by a while ago and had something that I signed 30 years ago for him, and I told him to come back. 30 more years, I'll sign something else for it. <laughs> now, both racers are famous for banging gears in their four speed 68 Cudas. I'll leave the starting line at about 7,000 RPMs, and we ship at about 8,500. And it'll go through on a good run, uh, about, about 8,600 in high gear. I mean, people don't like to hear it, but these are men's cars. This, this is a man's <laughs> car. When you're changing gears using the clutch pedal, it, it's work, but it's fun. I think the automatic is boring. I want to beat him, he wants to beat me, and uh, we put on a good show. It's a, it's, it's a little bit of a rush, I guess you'd call it. The Superstock stars did put on a good show with ETs that were consistently within a hundredth of each other. However, Sox seems to have a little more at the finish line to take this two out of three shootout. I mean, this will sound corny, but I'm honored to be running him because he was always my idol and I respect my elders. Nah, <laughs> I heard that. He didn't look like he respected that during the starting line, did he? <laughs> Well, whether they're NHRA legends, weekend bracket racers, here for the show or the go, you got to give it to the Mopar guys. They're a breed apart from the rest, and when it comes to their favorite brand... The world knows that Mopar probably is the best. Coming up next, the fast-breaking tip, choosing the right calipers for your brake setup.
Horsepower TV's Quick Tech is brought to you by WyoTech. Hey, welcome back. You know, having a lot of horsepower can be a lot of fun, but sooner or later, you're going to have to rein in those ponies. Now, the last time we showed you about the important role that rotors play in a high-performance braking system, and today we're going to show you how calipers have an equally important part. Now, this assortment of calipers includes a stocker, cast iron, and this assortment of high-performance, high-tech calipers that we got from our friends at Bear. Now, what do you say we take a look at the differences and figure out which is the right one for you? The stocker is a single piston floating caliper that slides back and forth on these pins whenever the brakes are applied. Now, it's inexpensive to produce, but somewhat inefficient since the single piston applies pressure to only one pad. Now, the pins can also deflect, and the integrity of the caliper is compromised by this big hole right here that allows it to be used with smaller stock steel wheels. Now, it also allows the caliper to deflect, giving you a spongy brake pedal. Next, we have an aluminum caliper that uses a steel anchored bracket to surround it and the pads so they're always parallel to the rotor. Now, this design reduces caliper flex significantly and the braking loads are transferred directly to this anchor bracket. Now, this adds up to better balanced clamping forces, improved driver control, and shorter stopping distances. Hey, this is a good upgrade for your street car. Now let's look at a fixed mount four piston caliper that uses opposed pistons to give you more stable application of the clamping forces. Now they also use different size pistons to compensate for the higher wear rate on the leading edge of the pads and to further equalize the pressure applied to them. These calipers are found on race cars and very serious street cars. Finally, we have the billet aluminum six piston caliper. Now this is a fixed mount design too and the material is the stiffest available to minimize deflection. It also uses a huge piston to pad ratio for optimum driver modulation. Now don't kid yourself, this is a race only piece and if you step on one of these bad boys, <laughs> you better be prepared to put your eyeballs back in their sockets. Hey, whether you drive a late model Camaro or Firebird, here's a way to put your LS1 on the bottle. This new kit from Nitrous Work is a single stage setup that'll add from 75 to 125 horsepower at the flick of a switch. This power wing nozzle injects fuel and nitrous at the same time to help simplify installation. So now you can spray your way to the winner's circle for about 475 bucks. Hey, nitrous isn't the only way to pump up the power in your fuel injected ride. For you throttle body guys, Summit has this new spacer kit that adds both torque and horsepower. Now the kit includes all the necessary mounting hardware and a spacer made from phenolic resin to isolate heat and give you more plenum volume. Now the result is a cooler, denser incoming fuel charge to give you more power just where you need it. Of course, you'll need to cough up about 65 bucks for this setup. We hope you enjoyed our fuel injection swap today. And if you've got one planned for yourself, well, here's how to add a GM throttle body or tune port and make it, well, painless. You see, Painless Performance has a complete wiring kit with all the connectors you need for modules, sensors, and injectors. You just provide the injection setup, the computer, and the labor. Price is pretty painless, too, at $240 and up. <laughs>